In this recent decision brought under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, we find out what this particular court feels like you should plead or you should put in your lawsuit. And it gives us some good rules about what's necessary to properly word a lawsuit so that your lawsuit can move forward. Now, this is a little bit unusual because the consumer here does not have a lawyer and they say, hey, because of financial situation, I want you to basically not make me pay a filing fee. The flip side of that is then the court is to look at the lawsuit as if a defendant filed a motion to dismiss and say, okay, did you properly plead this? Ultimately, the judge is going to say this was not properly pled under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and then we'll give some guidance on how to properly plead it. So that's what we want to look at here. So the basic gist of this is there's a Mariner finance account, and the consumer says, I disputed this because it was incomplete or inaccurate. And then the judge says, well, it looks like you've highlighted some supposed inaccurate information, but you don't tell me how it's inaccurate. And you have a letter to Mariner Finance that says, hey, give me some information or delete the account. And that will come up a little bit later. So let's get into kind of the heart of this. So this is section 1681 EB. This is the if we back up here, reasonable procedures to assure maximum possible accuracy. Now, this is only against the credit bureaus, and you can only bring this claim if you can show that somebody else has looked at your credit report, you know, has bought it, has received it. So this could be a soft pull, although some courts and defendants would you know, disagree with that. Uh, hard pull, uh, You've got to have that. It's not enough to just merely look at your own what's called file disclosure and say, hey, I see an error, so I'm going to sue you under EB. We need to show that somebody else has seen the report. And this particular judge puts four requirements. Now, one requirement that you know, has to be there is it has to be seen by somebody else. Okay, But here's the way this is broken down. And it's good that different judges kind of break these down differently. We all get to the same spot, but they kind of put maybe a different emphasis on a particular item. And so the more of these opinions you can read and sort of start to put together and make them fit, then you go, okay, now I see the way that I need to properly plead my lawsuit. So number one, inaccurate information. Number two was due to the failure to follow reasonable procedures. Number three, you suffered an injury. Number four, that injury was caused by that inaccurate entry. Now, just sort of, you know, full disclosure here. So when this judge mentions a credit report, that's talking about something that somebody else has seen. All right, so Fair Credit Reporting Act also says you can uh, request an investigation. And so if you dispute the completeness or accuracy of information in your file, so that's different than a credit report, file is just what you can have access to. So nobody else in the world has to look at it. If you see something that's incomplete, inaccurate in your file, you can do a dispute through the credit bureaus, and that's section 1681I. Just remember, I for investigation. All right, so to proceed under EB or I, you must show that the information is inaccurate. And if this is a frivolous dispute or if you didn't give enough information, then the a consumer reporting agency can terminate that investigation. So to state a plausible claim against a furnisher, you have to plead that the consumer reporting agency notified the furnisher of the dispute. Then the furnisher did a lousy investigation. So you could send a hundred letters to the furnisher. That's all great, but that's not enough to be able to sue the furnisher under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. You have to go through the credit bureaus, the consumer reporting agencies, and then they have to notify the furnisher. Now the furnisher has an obligation to investigate. And if they don't investigate it properly, now you can sue the furnisher. So here's an example. S2B, which is the, the case that or the, uh, the statute that we sue under. When a furnisher receives notice from a consumer reporting agency regarding the completeness or accuracy, the duty to conduct an investigation is triggered. And you can sue if they don't do that properly. So FCRA has several provisions create liability for violations of the act, but this S2B is the only section 
that can be enforced by a private citizen that's seeking to recover damages. And the judge says, well, you haven't uh, identified which sections you're going under, and so not sufficiently set forth facts describing what inaccurate information she believes was included in her consumer uh, reports or clearly explain why the information was inaccurate. I want to show you this because I don't know that every court agrees with this, but this is an important point and to why take a chance. Court will not speculate as to the consumer's claims based on the attachments to her complaint. You cannot state a claim, which is what we have to do when we file a lawsuit. We have to state a claim. So a motion to dismiss says they failed, that we failed to state a claim. So may not state a claim by relying solely on exhibits. So here's a case from 21. While a court may consider exhibits attached to a complaint, merely attaching exhibits is insufficient to meet the requirement. Complaint must contain sufficient factual mat uh, uh, matters, except as true, to state a claim for relief that's plausible on its face. That's the test under a motion to dismiss. So what the court's saying is, yeah, you attach some stuff and you may have highlighted some stuff, but you didn't tell me in the complaint itself what was wrong. You know, how this was a lousy investigation, whatever your allegations are. And so it says, to the extent Johnson seeks to present a claim against Mariner as a furnisher, the allegations are undeveloped. So not alleged that Mariner received notice from the Consumer Reporting Agency. So when we're suing a furnisher, we have to say, I sent a dispute, whether that's verbal, online, uh, by fax, letter, carrier pigeon, however, I notified the credit bureaus and then they notified the furnisher. And then the furnisher failed to do a proper investigation. Now, sometimes we plead it alternatively because we don't really know. We say the credit bureaus notified the furnisher. Alternatively, they did not notify the furnisher. Now, that means the furnisher is off the hook, but it also means that the credit bureau is now sort of in even deeper trouble because they did not notify the furnisher. So you can plead alternatively. This is under Rule 8 that tells us how we plead a case. We're allowed to plead things that are contradictory or in the alternative because, look, we, we haven't put anybody under oath. We don't know exactly what happened, so we can plead alternatively here. Okay, so under S2B, notice must be given by the credit reporting agency. And you'll notice we, we call this different things, consumer reporting agency, credit bureau. It's all the same thing. Credit reporting agency cannot come directly from the consumer. Uh, consumer may notify a furnisher creditor directly, but there's no private right of action under 1681 S2B for failure to properly investigate such dispute. Let me rephrase that slightly. If you notify a furnisher uh, under section 1681 S2A, they have an obligation to, first of all, properly report information and to investigate. But you can't sue them for that. You can only sue them under S2B when the furnisher is notified by the credit bureau. Okay, so here's the last part of this. And there's not much here, but this is a really important sentence here. Court will grant Johnson leave to amend to flesh out her allegations by explaining in an amended complaint the who, what, where, why, when, how, you know, it, the things we learned in, in the English class, right? So what we want to do is make sure that there's no excuse for a judge or a defendant to have our case thrown out. Well, how do we do that? Well, we make sure that we're clear who we're talking about. So we don't just say, you know, the defendant when we have five defendants, because the court's going to say, well, which defendant? Okay. Now, sometimes it's all defendants. Okay. But other times we need to distinguish. Well, what did they do or not do? So we need to explain that. The uh, inaccuracy, the error, the incomplete information, whatever it is, we need to describe that. What is it? Okay. Now, an easy way is to copy and paste your dispute letter into the lawsuit. Okay. So here's what I told TransUnion Equifax Experian. You got it all right there. And then you say, and they didn't fix anything or they only fixed, you know, uh, X, Y, and Z, but not the rest of it, whatever it is. The point is you want the judge bill to say, all right, 
Who's the bad guy? What did they do wrong? When did you notify them? How did you notify them? You know, what was wrong with their investigation? Now, again, we don't know all the details on this side of it. What we can say is, look, I clearly point out here are 18 ways the information is contradictory. And if TransUnion, Equifax, Experian, whoever did a proper dispute, they would have seen that there are these 18 contradictions and they would have fixed them. They did not do that. And if they're not going to fix it, they should have deleted the account. They did not do that. So the judge goes, oh, okay, I get that now. I see what you claim the errors are, and I see how they didn't fix it. Now, this kind of makes us work backwards and say, well, if I'm doing that in my lawsuit, what does my dispute letter need to say? And I have no idea what the dispute letter in this particular case said. But just imagine the dispute letter says, uh, I am disputing inaccurate or incomplete information on the following seven accounts. And that's it. Well, what are those errors? What is incomplete about it? What's inaccurate about it? Now, we could go the next step and attach the credit report that's marked up. Well, that's a good start. Okay, that's good. And, and they can see some stuff. But is it clear? I mean, in other words, are we just like highlighting stuff? And they go, okay, well, what am I supposed to do with the highlight information? Or are we connecting it? Are we writing stuff on it? So if you're not going to put it in the letter, which I strongly recommend that you put the details in the letter, but at least in the, the credit report that's marked up, you explain it like this contradicts this over here, or you know, you make it very clear to me, the best way to do this is what we call the show and tell method, just like when we were in school. And instead of just talking about something, we also show it. So the the show part of show and tell is the marked up credit report. Okay. And it's got lines and arrows and stuff circled and highlighted. The tell part is your letter. So everything that you show in the credit report, tell it in the letter. Everything that you tell in the letter should be shown in the credit report or, or yeah, the marked up credit report. So you put all that together and you do a really detailed letter that shows and tells exactly what's wrong, what's missing, what's in error. Then that makes it so much easier when you file a lawsuit because you drop that into the, the complaint. Okay. Now you may put the images in the complaint or you may just put the text and then say, you know, the, the uh, dispute letter is attached as an exhibit. You can do that. Or if you properly described it, that may be enough. Now you can also embed images into your word document, your dispute letter, and then that could be put into, you, you know, dropped into your lawsuit. So there's all different ways of doing it. Okay, and there are advantages and disadvantages, there's strategy involved in this. But the big picture principle here is make sure that at the end, when you file the lawsuit, the judge can tell what you're claiming is wrong. And then back that up to the beginning, make sure the credit bureaus can tell what you say is wrong because they will forward your letter through the system called eOscar. It'll be attached to what's called the ACDV. That's the uh, what automated consumer dispute verification form that says, here's what you're disputing, but they put the letter with it. So then the furnisher gets that and they have no excuse now because they can read your letter. And if your letter clearly tells and clearly shows what's wrong, that makes it easy for the furnisher to fix it. And when they don't fix it or delete it, it makes it an easier lawsuit because the judge can be looking at them saying, well, did you get this letter? that broke out every single error. And they go, well, yeah, yes, your honor. Well, did you get the marked up credit report that should, well, yes, your honor, we got that too. And what did you do? Uh, we just verified that the consumer had this account with us and yeah, we thought we were done. Well, we did a video on this a couple days ago where the court says that's a lousy investigation. You have to actually address the issues raised in the, dispute letter, assuming that what's being raised in the letter 
is identifying things that are inaccurate or incomplete. Okay, guys, appreciate you watching this. Hope you found it helpful, and I will catch you guys in the next video. Have a good one. Bye-bye.